a rather exciting passage of scripture before us today. In Exodus chapter 14, we find the children of Israel in terror, in panic. They're wedged between the sea and Pharaoh's army. We find them crying out in the preceding verses as we looked at last week, screaming and falling on their faces and running around. And Moses tells them to stand still. Moses tells them, see the salvation of your God. Magnificent miracle here in the Old Testament. Not like the liberals say when they say, well, children of Israel were traveling light and Pharaoh uh, and his chariots got stuck in the mud and so they got away. That's not the picture that we have here. We have the power of the Shekinah glory which has been leading the children of Israel down to the edge of the sea. Pharaoh is gleeful. He's so happy. They're, they're wedged in in the wilderness. They're stuck in a, a groove between the mountains right in front of the sea and he can blockade them in and they cannot get away. And so he sends 600 chosen chariots and all the rest of his chariots too. But the 600 go out first and then the rest of his troops begin to march, begin to march, begin to march. And the children of Israel see them coming. And there's panic and there's terror. And they're crying out, why didn't you let us die in Egypt? We would rather have been slaves in Egypt than to have our graves in an unmarked wilderness. How many times in our own lives have we come to the point of panic? How many times in our lives have we come to the point whereby we're in terror of what will happen next? Distress, anguish, terror. That's coming again on the world, you know. There is coming a time when the world will be under a one world ruler. There's coming a time when there will be no freedom of religion. We think there are persecutions going on now. We've seen nothing yet. There will come a time of great darkness and also of the judgment of God upon earth. The book of Revelation describes it. Imagine that and then think of the children of Israel as they fear for their lives because they do not understand the eternal perspective. Oh, if only we could get God's perspective on all of human history and see how he is in sovereign control of all the things that happen and there are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. No accidents, only incidents in the sovereign plan of God. Now last week we began looking at this incredible phenomenon which is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night in verses 19 and 20. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel and it was a cloud of darkness to them that is to the Egyptians but it gave light by night to these, that is the Israelites, so that the one came not near the other all the night. We're going to see some verses a little bit later on that tell us just how thick that darkness was and why the Egyptians did not dare try to move through the darkness and take the Israelite camp at night. The unarmed Israelites against the massive Egyptian army we'll discover that that darkness, there's a special word that is used for thickness. It's a thickness that can be touched. It was so dark, they couldn't stick their hand in front of their face and see it. They didn't dare move. God immobilized an entire army with darkness. Gives to us an incredible picture of something else. I mentioned it a few moments ago. For those who do not trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, there is a darkness coming. Not a darkness of non-existence, but a darkness where they can see nothing and yet they will feel flames that burn and do not consume. That's what we're told about the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. It's composed of the holy angels, according to the book of Psalms. It's composed of those angels which are called seraphim, which means the burning ones. 
as it was on the bush in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses saw a bush that burned but was not consumed and he said I'll go and see what this is and as he approached God said to him Moses take off your shoes the ground that you're standing on is holy ground the flame that burns but does not consume gives us an incredible picture of what is coming yet for those who do not believe but notice the other side of it it says it gave light by night to the Israelites it's separated between the two one side couldn't go over to the other side and the other side couldn't go over to the first side there's a division between those who are God's people and those who are not God's people and so we began to trace light as it appears in Scripture particularly the light of the Shekinah glory we looked briefly at Deuteronomy chapter 1 to get a better understanding of how long it took to move a minimum of two million people at once and so we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and chapter 2 and just went through it very briefly so I'll only summarize it for you without reading the rest of it we notice that Moses gave details about the journey of the Israelites we saw that in verses 37 through 46 Moses discussed the reason that they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness including the reason that God told him that he would not get to go into the promised land he would get to see it but he couldn't go in finally we saw in chapter 2 that God told them to move north after they had crossed the sea and we also learned that they spent their greatest amount of time in the wilderness at Kadesh Barnea then we saw that the light is one of the grandest themes of the Bible you find it everywhere if you're not looking for it you might overlook it but you suddenly begin as you look through all the passages that deal with this divine light you suddenly discover that it's one of the biggest themes that God has put into the Bible first of all we saw that Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel guarded Israel gave darkness to the Egyptians revealed God to Israel and he is the one who reveals the Father to us he said so in John chapter 12 verse 46 I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness the second thing that we saw was Jesus himself fulfills the prophecies of bringing light to those that sat in darkness and Matthew quotes that over in Matthew chapter 4 16 quoting out of the book of Isaiah the people which sat in darkness saw great light and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death light is sprung up and he's referring to Jesus third we saw that Jesus himself is the light and all the references to the Shekinah glory in the New Testament speak of him when you look at them in their contexts John 1 verse 4 and 5 and following in him was life and the life was the light of men the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not verse 8 he was speaking of John the Baptist he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world we get down to chapter 3 and discover that because of that every one of us will be held accountable for either receiving the light or rejecting the light listen to what it says in John chapter 3 verse 19 and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world now who has John been talking about this whole time he's been talking about Jesus chapter 1 defines Jesus as the light and as the life and as the truth and as the word the word was made manifest and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory that's the Shekinah the glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth John chapter 1 verse 14 John has been setting the stage to point out that Jesus is in fact the light and the resident of the Shekinah glory Shekinah in Hebrew but we call it the Shekinah in English that is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world and listen to verse 19 and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light 
because their deeds were evil. When the light shines, you have two options. Either open your eyes and see the wonderful things that the light is revealing, or closing your eyes because you will not see the things that the light is revealing. And if you close your eyes to the divine light that God has given in his word, you are already, it says, under condemnation. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. John is pretty blunt. Either he's telling us the truth about Jesus or he's lying to us. Those are really your only two options. There are other options here that are given to us as possibilities. The fourth thing that we saw was we saw two stages to being light. While Jesus himself was here, he was the light of the world. Jesus spake unto them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That was stage number one. But then we saw stage number two. After Jesus went back to heaven, he has called us to reflect his light and to be a light to all those who are around us as we walk through the darkness of the king of darkness in the kingdom of darkness. We are supposed to be lights. Jesus said so in Matthew chapter 5 beginning in verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The sixth thing that we learned last week is we are called children of light because a child reflects the character of his father. I can see that with my 13 kids. <laughs> and I can see some things I don't like in my 13 kids. And you know what it points back to? It points back to me as their father because they picked up not just what I hope are good things, but they've picked up some bad things too. They picked up some attitudes. They have picked up some stubbornness. Now, I like to talk about it as conviction. But I suspect other people look at me and they say, that's not conviction, that's stubbornness. Well, that's what I see anyway in my kids. I don't know about you, but as you think back over it, your parents made an impact on your life. I bury my mother this coming Wednesday and I am so thankful for the impact that she made on my life. She was 95 years old. I flew to Texas to celebrate her 95th birthday just a few months ago. She stepped out of the darkness of this world into the light, the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. She's there with my dad. Both of them had an incredible impact on my life. I know that were it not for them, I would not be here today. Your parents have an impact on you. You have an impact on your children. You will have an impact on your grandchildren that passes down from generation to generation to generation. The question is, what are we passing on? Are we passing light or are we passing darkness? Are we passing truth or are we passing lies? Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is the word of God. Is not the word of man. Liberals have tried to make it into the word of man, but this stands over the centuries and has never yet been destroyed, though many have tried to burn it, mutilate it, kill the people who carried it, kill those who have copies of it, tried to change it, tried to eradicate it, try to prove it wrong, but they haven't done it yet. This is the word of God. And you and I have the great privilege of having copies in our own language that we might know the will of God. We're called children of light because a child reflects the character 
of his father. Number seven, we saw while he, Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him at the transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17, magnificent passage. That's where he's transfigured on the mount. He was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And as you know, Moses and Elijah appeared with him. Elijah was taken up into heaven with the Shekinah, the chariots of God separated between Moses uh, between Elijah and between Elisha and Elijah was taken up in this whirlwind up into heaven. Moses is the one we see today in our passage standing by the edge of the Red Sea as the pillar of cloud and fire goes from before the camp of Israel. It's been leading them toward the sea. It goes behind them and stands between them and the Egyptians. And it's Moses also who appears with him on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. Number eight, we saw that Jesus is the source of spiritual light. That is the source of salvation light and the source of sanctification light. Paul preaches that in Acts chapter 26, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Have you made it out of the darkness yet? Are you still in the kingdom of darkness? In the kingdom, it says, of Satan. Satan controls this world, according to Scripture. But someday he's going to get defeated. He doesn't know it, but he was actually defeated at the cross. But he's actually going to be taken and chained. And Jesus is going to establish his righteousness. Which kingdom are you functioning in? And as you're functioning, are you functioning as darkness or as you're functioning as light? When people look at you, when people hear you speak, when people perceive your attitudes, do they see Jesus? Or do they see the ways of the world and the flesh and the devil? What shows up in our lives every day when we come in contact with other people? Jesus is the source of our light, both for salvation and sanctification. We saw last week, number nine, that he's the source of our fellowship. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We saw that light was not only number ten for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship, but it is also what characterizes our spiritual armor. Paul says so in Romans 13, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Number 11. And then we sort of jumped ahead. I jumped to the end of the message last week and skipped over a bunch of things because I wanted to point out that Jesus is our light now, but he will also be our light in heaven and for all of eternity. We saw that in Colossians and 1 John. We saw it in the book of Revelation. The light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, speaking of the heavenly Jerusalem, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more, having the glory of God. Her light was unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. You know, the children of Israel, as they stood by the sea, didn't need to light their little oil lamps. Why? Because the light of the glory, the Shekinah, the light of the glory of God gave them light all night, but it produced darkness for the Egyptians. There's coming a day in the heavenly Jerusalem where we won't need the light of the sun or of the moon or of the stars. We won't need mechanical lights or electrical lights like these. We don't need oil lamps. It says the glory of God will lighten the city. And it tells us where the light comes from. The Lamb is the light thereof. Do you remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? It says the next day John seeth Jesus coming. Chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming. and says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb is the light of the city. 
You see, Jesus is always, from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, the one who not only dwells in, but through whom and producing this incredible, infinite light that burns away all evil and gives light to his people. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Jesus, the resident of the Shekinah glory, is the light. He's the one who led Israel across the Red Sea and through the wilderness. He is the one who leads us all the way. So I want to go back a little bit today and pick up the other key references to light in Scripture that point to our Lord Jesus Christ, some specific statements of that. Did you know that Jesus was also in the light of the Shekinah that struck down Paul on the road to Damascus? In Acts chapter 9, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues. Paul's foaming at the mouth. He hates the Christians so bad. That if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, now listen. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That should be our response. When we come face to face with Jesus, when we suddenly understand that he is the living God, he is the one who is the eternal light, He's the one who said, I am the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. When we come face to face with him, our response should be, What wouldst thou have me to do? Not merely what to believe. What do you want me to do? There is the call not only to faith, but to obedience to follow the Lord Jesus Christ who will lead you perhaps to the very edge of the sea which is impassable and you've got Pharaoh and his army behind you and you're terrified but you know that's where God led you. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Have you asked him that question? Or have you sort of tried to hide and hope that he looks for somebody else? Because, after all, you're very very comfortable in your current life. In, in your current life, you, you're, you're getting a bunch of money. Stuff. You're gaining things of earth and not realizing that there are some things that are more valuable than the things of heaven. You know, I've been recently struck, once again, with the multiple deaths that we have had in this church. Just how short life is. And some of those folks were pretty old. They lived a long time on earth, but you know what? They didn't take one nickel with them. All the stuff that we build up here on earth like Solomon looked at it and he said, you know, he says, I got all this stuff, but what good is it? Because I'm going to leave it to somebody and I don't know whether he'll be wise or whether he'll be a fool. In Solomon's case, the wisest man on earth at that time, he left it to Rehoboam, who was a fool, who split the kingdom, who brought all kinds of chaos and destruction into the kingdom that David and Solomon had built. What 
good are things of earth unless they are used for the glory of God. We are not owners. We are only stewards of something God has entrusted to us to use for his glory and not merely for our own personal pleasure and affluence and foolishness. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, I am Jesus speaking to him from the Shekinah glory. And Paul, as a good Jew, would have known about the Shekinah glory, which appears over and over and over and over and over in the Old Testament. And the prophetic passages, such as in Ezekiel, where the Shekinah glory departs from the city of Jerusalem and goes from the Temple Mount to the top of the Mount of Olives and pauses, and then it disappears into the wilderness. He would have known about the crossing of the Red Sea. He would have known about the, the chariot of fire that came and separated between Elijah and Elisha. He would have known about the passages in Isaiah that talk about the light shining in the darkness. He understood that. And suddenly, he sees it. And what a shock to discover that the very one whose name he was trying to obliterate. The very one whom he was trying to destroy is the resident of the Shekinah glory. There's a, three times, three times in the book of Acts, we have this recorded for us. Here where it happens. And then twice more, Paul goes back to this very incident and in both of his sermons, one where he's almost been killed, where he has gone into the temple to bring his offerings after many years and fulfill his Nazarite vow and the Jews find him there and they're going about to kill him and the Romans come down and they rescue him and they pull him up, drag him up the stairs and Paul says, hey, wait a minute guys, can I preach for a minute? <laughs> Boy, that's an amazing situation. And I say, okay, go ahead. He starts to preach. You know what he preaches? The point at which they get angry? They get angry when he tells them that the Shekinah glory of God, Jesus spoke out of that and told him, I'm going to send you out to the Gentiles. And they rip their clothes and they pull their hair out and they throw dust in the air and say, away with this fellow. It's not fit for him to live upon the earth. That's over in Acts chapter 22. He just told them about Jesus being the resident of the Shekinah. They didn't want to hear it. We find it again over in Acts chapter 26 where Paul is standing before King Agrippa and giving his defense before Agrippa. Again states that Christ was the one who spoke to him from the Shekinah glory. Paul knew that he had seen Jesus and that Jesus was the one who had led Israel through the wilderness. The pre-incarnate Christ. He didn't take on human flesh until the virgin birth. We're moving into that season now. He didn't become a man until that moment that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and Jesus was conceived in her womb supernaturally without the agency of any man. And then he was born. Fully God, fully man, God incarnate, and John says, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. What are we talking about? We beheld his glory. In the Old Testament, that's what the Shekinah is called. It's called the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 6, it tells us that the glory of God filled the temple. And the pillars of the temple shook. And Isaiah heard the angels crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the smoke and the cloud and the fire filled the temple. The same pillar of fire and cloud that rested upon the goat hair tent called the tabernacle as they moved through the wilderness now fills the temple. As the priests were ministering after the Solomonic temple was built, they were dedicating the temple and the glory of God so much filled that temple that it drove the priests out of the temple. There was so much incredible power. Dear ones, Paul calls Jesus the Lord 
of glory. And he tells us that in the context of Jesus dying for our sins, that we might be reconciled to God. That is how much Jesus loved you. To step down from the courts of heaven, where he reigns sovereign over all of the universes, step down from the courts of heaven into a smelly animal stable in humility. In Philippians, Paul says, in being found in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore also God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's the one who loved you. That's the one who died for you. That he might bring, as the book of Hebrews tells us, that he might bring many sons to glory. The Shekinah is heaven that gives light all night long. And there's no need of the candle or of the sun or of the moon. For the Lord God doth lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Scripture is a unit. It's not a bunch of funny little books that got cobbled together by some redactor who thought, well, this is kind of cool. Why don't I stick this one in? It all points to Jesus. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 24? He was walking with the two on the road to Emmaus. Soon we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table. And he said, why are you so sorry and sad? And they said, haven't you heard? Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? And they told him all about the Lord Jesus who had died on the cross, but their eyes were holden. That is, they, they didn't recognize him. And he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning what? Himself. All of scripture points to Jesus. Our time is up. We'll soon be partaking of the elements of the Lord's table. But remember, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the one who came to die for our sins, which we will memorialize in just a moment. But he didn't remain dead because he is the Lord of glory. On the third day, according to the scriptures, even as it was prophesied in the Old Testament, he rose from the dead, which gives us the guaranteed hope of eternal life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. It is indeed the word of God and not the word of man. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Father, we thank you that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We thank you that he was buried. We thank you that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We thank you that you have indeed promised and your word is true that all those who place their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ 
have, present tense, the gift of eternal life. And so, Father, as we come before this, your table today, as we come to partake of the elements which memorialize for us the body and blood of Christ, we come thanking you that it is through Jesus and Jesus alone that our sins are forgiven and we have your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.